Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, where today Azimuth Marks in the Tier 10 Japanese destroyer, the Shimakaze, is going to be having a few tight squeaks in this uh, Tier 10, I think it's a brawl, hence only six ships per side, but it's arms race mode here on the Islands of Ice map. Got the old steel camouflage there on the Shimakaze, I'm seeing that pop up quite a lot lately. Not quite sure why. Maybe there's a sale on. Anyway, a um, couple of things to note. Only six ships per side. He's got the Swift and Silent skill there, which is basically a free engine boost as long as you're not spotted. The matchmakers and its old tricks again, of course. It's given the enemy team a carrier, <laughs> and, uh, and Azimuth's team does not. So that's going to be a problem, particularly for a destroyer captain. You'll note that he's turned his AA guns off in order to not give his position away and get spotted from the air by opening up early on any enemy aircraft. And here they come. Oh, wait, which way are they going? He's, it's almost like they're homing in on him. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, he's about to get spotted anyway, so he's not losing anything by opening up, even with his pitifully weak anti-aircraft guns. Well, I think it's safe to say that the carrier has just successfully spotted the entire team, with the exception of the Minotaur, who's uh, heading off over there to the east. Right, undetected, AA guns off again. And while Azimuth is jockeying for position here, today's video is mostly going to be about the use of the radio position finding skill. Now. I'm sure many of you know exactly what that skill does, but not everybody who watches these videos actually plays World of Warships. So for the benefit of those who have no idea how the skill works, let me just give you a quick explanation. So if you see sort of here on the screen, can't really see it too well right now because there's an island in the way, but there we go. There's a sort of arc. That indicates the position of the nearest enemy ship. It doesn't tell him what the ship is. It doesn't tell him how far away it is. It just points in the direction of the nearest enemy ship. So that's some useful information to have. It's not terribly useful at the start of a battle when there's all kinds of enemy ships everywhere and any one of them could be the closest ship. But towards the end of a battle, when there aren't that many enemy ships left, it becomes particularly useful. And there's the enemy destroyer, the Lucian. You can see that RPF is pointing straight towards him. He is the closest enemy. The thing about RPF is that while this is valuable information to have, it kind of also works both ways, because the Lucian will have an indicator on his screen letting him know that he is being lit up by RPF. At the moment, however, Azimuth Marks is having a really, really bad day. It's as if everything that could possibly go wrong just went wrong. The Lucian popped his Hydro, keeping him detected. Everybody who had a shot at him took shots at him because he's in the Shimakaze and nobody wants to get torpedoed. Marks attempted to turn and break contact and only succeeded in pinning himself up against the Zhao there, eating shot after shot into his broadside, which has robbed him of half of his health and knocked his engine out. I'm sure the Zhao wasn't too happy either because, of course, any shots that were aimed at Marks and missed probably spanked the Zhao's broadside too. Um, so, yeah, that just happened. Not a great start. More than half of his health gone in the first couple of minutes of the battle. It doesn't look like the torpedoes are going to hit anything either. And, uh, yeah, the enemy destroyer's gotten away, basically scot-free. Oh well. So while Azimuth Marks is licking his wounds, can we just take a moment to appreciate the name of the friendly Christopher Columbus over there? <laughs> Big breast enjoyer. Uh, <laughs> I suspect this may be the North American server. Uh, however, that friendly battleship is running straight into the middle of a crossfire. Although the enemy incomparable over there did just eat some torpedoes from somebody, maybe the Christopher Columbus can take him out before his inevitable demise. Maybe. Get some shots out. No, nope, he's dead. Enemy team now ahead on point. Second Christopher Columbus there looks like... No, he's not repeating the same mistake. He is, in fact, focusing the incomparable who does take another big spanking. The enemy Lucian is still clean lurking around the side of the island, hence all of these torpedoes and, well, the presence of the smoke screen there. You don't really need the RPF skill pointing towards him to know that that's kind of where he is. Although the 
look, the location marker has just flipped. It's now pointing straight towards the Schlieffen. So that's both good news and bad news, because it means that the Schlieffen is now the closest enemy ship, so the Lucian has backed off. But the fact that the Lucian has backed off is, is not great news, because it means we're dealing with an enemy destroyer captain who's capable of thinking and breathing at the same time. And that's the worst kind of enemy destroyer captain. The friendly Christopher Columbus over there is on very low health, was forced to turn in order to avoid airdropped torpedoes from the Roosevelt, which means he's now given a big flat broadside to the Schlieffen. And let's not forget the Schlieffen has torpedoes of its own. Meanwhile, over here, it doesn't look like the friendly Minotaur needs help dealing with the enemy Napoli. Appearances, however, can be deceptive. We'll come back to that in a moment. For now, while I have the opportunity, I'd like to tell you a little story about some real-world experience with radio position finding. Oh, what's going on over here? Is he going to get... He's going to get the Schlieffen. He's going to get... He is. Yes. All right. I don't know if that's going to be enough to save the Christopher Columbus. Who, by the way, has another amazing name. Show me your double Ds. <laughs> oh! Well, good news, bad news. Uh, the other Christopher Columbus has just sunk the enemy carrier already, so that's great. But the, uh, the first Christopher Columbus has, of course, gone down. And that's bad, but not terrible. What happens next is terrible. The enemy Republic sinks the team's last remaining battleship, the one who sank the enemy carrier. And somehow the Minotaur has managed to arrange a way to lose a gunfight that he has no business losing against the Napoli. Which means that Azimuth Marks in a badly mauled Shimakaze, and the Zhao on the other end of the map are the only two ships remaining alive on the team, against three enemies. Mark's got some torpedoes away against the Napoli, but um, I mean they're not going to hit anything unless that Napoli just continues sailing in a straight line towards the wreck of the Minotaur. Oh, the Napoli just continued sailing in a straight line towards the wreck of the Minotaur. So that happened. Two versus two. Destroyer and cruiser versus destroyer and battleship. The RPF indicator is now switched with the death of the Napoli and is now obviously pointing towards somebody, but whether it's the Republic or the Lucian, we don't know. So anyway, about that real-world radio position finding experience. As I'm sure many of you were aware, I spent 22 years in the Royal Navy and my first four years in the Navy I was a radio operator. Oh, bugger, the zao has been sunk. By the Lucian, too. Well, I suppose the good news is now we know almost exactly where the Lucian is, or was. Uh, but anyway, yes. Radio position finding in the Royal Navy was the responsibility of the radio operators, because it's radio position finding. I think these days it's the responsibility of the Electronic Warfare Department, because that does kind of make more sense. But certainly back in the day, and in my first few years in the Royal Navy, it was the responsibility of the radio operators. There was a bit of a problem with that, though. None of us were trained in how to actually use it. <laughs> we had this piece of equipment tucked away at the back of the communications office where hopefully nobody would uh, remember it existed called the HFDF or High Frequency Direction Finder. But the reason that nobody was trained in how to use it was, well, there were two reasons. One, it was basically obsolete. And two, the Electronic Warfare Department were already doing the same thing, but better and more efficiently, because they had up-to-date equipment to do exactly the same thing. But the HFDF, or RPF set, was still there in the communications office. Some torpedoes away there against the Republique. They're only going to hit that Republique if he, while getting spotted by what he knows has to be a destroyer, if he continues sailing the same course and speed for at least the next minute. So let's see about that. Meanwhile, yep. <laughs> you couldn't make this shit up, could you? <laughs> oh, now he starts turning when he sees them and it's too late. Oh man, that's beautiful. Okay, with the demise of the Republic, I'll have to finish this story later. With the demise of the Republic, the RPF skill switched, and it's now pointing straight towards the Lucian because he's the only other ship left on the enemy team for it to point towards. But bear in mind, the Lucian is now also going to have an indicator on his screen telling him that somebody has him on RPF. Now, it doesn't work the same way as it's working for Azimuth Marks here. It doesn't, like, you know, point back towards him. The only information that the Lucian has is that Azimuth Marks knows which way to go to find him. Although at the moment that information is kind of redundant because the key area just appeared, the single cap circle that appears 
in an arms race battle and the Lushan is clearly in it because he's capping. So the skill isn't really providing Azimuth marks with anything that he didn't already know, although that key area is pretty big so he's at least getting some value out of it. The thing is though, this key area in arms race, it starts off big and then it shrinks as the battle goes on, forcing any remaining combatants into closer and closer proximity if they want to take this cap circle. And while the enemy destroyer doesn't have RPF, because Azimuth Marks doesn't have the indicator letting him know that he is being detected by it, because he has to contest this cap circle, it kind of tells the enemy destroyer sort of where he is anyway. And there's the Lucian, and uh, he has chosen violence, which is absolutely the right choice, because he is definitely going to outgun a Shimakaze, and Azimuth Marks knows it too. I mean, the Shimakaze's guns have a fairly big alpha strike, they hit kind of hard, but they just do not hit often enough to win a gunfight against something like that. He might get lucky here with the torpedoes. Oh, he's being hydroed. So he's not going to be able to hide in this smokescreen. And with hydro running, it's extremely unlikely that... The, in fact, yeah, if they were going to hit him, they would already have done so. So, yeah, he's dodged the torpedoes too. And he is absolutely going to win a gunfight. And he knows exactly, thanks to the hydro, where Azimuth Marks is and... Well, Marx only has a rough indication of which direction the Lucian is behind. Oh, it just flipped. He's coming around that side of the island, torpedoes away. You see, the Lucian here thinks he has the advantage. He's thinking, who is this idiot staying inside hydro range? But thanks to that RPF indicator flipping to the right-hand side of the island at the last possible second, Azimuth Marx knew exactly where to launch his torpedoes, even though he never at any point actually saw the Lucian, the Lucian that was detecting him and shooting at him and very nearly sank him the whole time. But that RPF skill flipping to show exactly which side of the island the Lucian was poking around, ironically enough, taking advantage of Azimuth Mark's own smokescreen to stay almost undetected the whole time. But that was what sealed the deal, allowing Azimuth Marks to survive by the skin of his teeth, sinking four of the six enemy ships in the process. And now I really suppose I should finish that story about my real world radio position finding experience. So as mentioned, we had this HFDF, or High Frequency Direction Finding, kit. It was a tiny little box, tucked away at the back of the main communications office where everybody could ignore it and pretend it didn't exist, because none of us were trained in using it, because it was obsolete, and the Electronic Warfare Department were basically doing the same thing, just better. But the kit was still there. Here's a picture of the one that you can see on HMS Belfast, the HFDF. We just called it the Huff Duff. Um, and the one that we had on board HMS Brazen in 1990 wasn't that much more advanced. <laughs> like I said, this kit was basically obsolete. But because it was still there, we could still be tested on its use. So after coming back from the first Gulf War and enjoying a bit of leave and maintenance, before we could be deployed again, we had to undergo basic operational sea training just to make sure you know everybody still knew what to do. And there was a, a Royal New Zealand Navy communications officer, a lieutenant commander working for Flag Officer Sea Training, who had a bit of a reputation for, well, a couple of things. First, he was a bit of a bastard. His nickname was the Rottweiler, right? And, uh, and he really loved high-frequency direction finding. So when he walked into the communications office during a battle exercise, we knew we were in trouble. <laughs> sure enough, the first thing he did was, show me where your HFDF is. So the leading radio operator in charge of the shift, Bertie Burton, I remember the panicked look of terror on his face <laughs> very well, kind of sloped it off onto me and said, well, go on, then you show him. <laughs> so I took him to the back of the office, pointed at this box and said, there you go, sir. That's the Huff Duff. And he said, right, get me a bearing on Portishead Radio Lighthouse. I didn't even know that Portishead Lighthouse had a radio beacon. <laughs> I certainly didn't know how to use the box. So I said, I'm sorry, sir, I haven't been trained how to use it. He said, right, find me somebody who has. Uh, that took some time because nobody had. In fact, even the petty officer radio supervisor, the RS, the second he saw this guy come into the office, he immediately abandoned his action station and found somewhere else to be rather than being forced to admit that not a single member of the communications staff of HMS Brazen in 1990 knew how to operate the high-frequency direction finder or the RPF. So that's my little story. Uh, unsurprisingly, we failed that exercise. <laughs> uh, but I don't think anybody ever actually learned how to use it. Anyway, that's the story. I hope you all enjoyed the video. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.